Edgardo furious and Lucia in despair, both of them having been tricked by Enrico, the curtain falls on Act Two of Donizetti's Lucia de Lammermoor in this broadcast live from the stage of the Metropolitan Opera House in New York City. And here are Arturo Gregory Ture, who will take part in the benefit gala at the Met tomorrow afternoon and also in the new Moses and Aaron. Elisa Jane Shawless, who will be heard in the new Susanna. Normano Ronald Naldi, whom we'll hear next in the broadcast of Aida. And now, coming on stage, here are Anthony Michaels Moore, Enrico, Ruth Ann Swenson, Lucia, Ramon Vargas, Edgardo, and Alistair Miles. The chaplain and Ramondo all bowing together as the bravos ring out through the house, smiling at each other. Ruth Ann Swenson, of course, in her lovely white bridal gown. The chorus master is Raymond Hughes, musical preparation by Joan Dorneman, Stephen Eldridge, Gareth Morrow, yeah. and Catherine. Yeah, Edgardo er rast, når han har forladt selskabet, og Raimondo prøver at trøste den ulykkelige Lucia. Sådan slutter anden akt af Donizetti's Lucia di Lammermoor. Her var det Ruth Ann Swenson som Lucia, Ramon Vargas som Edgardo, Anthony Michael Moore sang Enrico, Alastair Miles sang Raimondo, Jane Charles, Alisa, og så har... Metropolitan Opera er altså en luksus, som ikke mange andre operahuse har. Indtil nu som Gregory Ture, som de fleste andre steder højst sandsynligt vil synge Edgardos parti i Lucille Lammermoor, han synger det lille rolle som Arturo. Det kan de tillade sig på Metropolitan Opera. Og det er der var deres øh, kororkester, der sang og spillede under ledelse alt sammen af Carlo Rizzi. Og om cirka 20 minutter, så er der så kommer tredje akt af Lucia de Lammervor, og i pausen er der operakvist, som sædvanlig over fra Metropolitan Operan, og det er Martin Bernheimer, der er quizmaster i dag. I dag er det jo i USA, det er eftermiddag derover. Og i panelet sidder en forsvarsadvokat, han hedder Philip Gainsley, og han er der ikke i egenskab af forsvarsadvokat, han er der, fordi han skriver og, om og underviser i opera. Så er der Alfred Hubay, som er konsulent ved Metropolitan Operans marketingafdeling, og endelig tv-produceren Alan Wagner, som er i gang med at lave en film, der handler om, musi- øh, om Johann Sebastian Bachs musik. De tre er det altså, der skal øh, dyste her i Metropolitan Operans quiz. Thank you, Peter Allen, and good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Every opera lover worth his or her tessitura knows that the literature abounds in trouser roles, that is, roles in which a soprano or a mezzo-soprano appears wearing pants, usually those of a boy. Now, into the breaches, as it were, <laughs> steps Jan Cadlitz of Muncie, Indiana, who hears us over station WBSB and who raises a more intriguing topic, nightgown roles. Poor dotty Lucia de Lammermoor will soon dispatch her groom on her wedding night and appear for her mad scene wearing, what else, a bloodied nightgown. So, Mr. Gainsley, Mr. Hubay, Mr. Wagner, can you name any other heroines, or heroes for that matter, who sing their guts out wearing nightgowns? Mr. Gainsley. Well, Lady Macbeth sings it when she talks to her dog, Outspot, out. <laughs> <laughs> when she has the blood on her hand that she's trying to rid of. It. She can't sleep. The sleepwalking scene. Sleepwalking scene. Of course. Mr. Wagner. Yeah, speaking of sleepwalking, La Sonambula, Amina, uh, staggers along a very thin railing in her nightgown and wakes up just in time to keep from falling to her death. Indeed yeah. true. Mr. Hubeck. There was an opera at the City Opera about 15 years ago called Lady Havisham's Fire, where she does the whole mass in a nightgown. Dominic Argento, I think, was the composer. So it's, it's a whole new genre, the nightgown role in the nightgown opera. Mr. Gainsley. I'm also thinking of Juliet in the, um, that wonderful act that begins with the, uh, on the wedding night. And she's sitting, he's sitting on the edge of her bed. She's in the bed. I'm sure she's in her nightgown. Does the opera have a name? Romeo and Juliet, I'm ah, sorry. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and we're talking about Zandonai, right? <laughs> Lady Macbeth of Minsk. <laughs> uh, Mr. Hubert. There's also Ophelia. I don't know whether she's got the night count on the mat scene or not, but she gets the, that point. But she doesn't, Tomas, she certainly should. She should have had the night count. Indeed. Count. Mr. Wagner. Well, um, and in, uh, in Othello, poor Desdemona is strangled in her night count and on her bed. You're doing very well. What about a man? What about gentlemen in night attire? Mr. Gainsley. Oh, I'm thinking of Johnny Skeeky. Yes, indeed. Mm-hmm. And uh, what's his name? Guazzo Donati. Guazzo Donati. Right. 
is in his nightgown and, and his nightcap. The whole th story being that Mr. Skiki is impersonating the dead right. Buozo Donati on his deathbed. Right? Is that, that's what you Right, mean. dictating his will. Any other men in nightclubs? There are not as many of them. I think this is I'm pleased to know that. Then I yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the only one I can think of, of course, was um, Don, uh, Don Magnifico in Cenerentola, who makes his entrance, angry that the girls have roused him from his sleep. Ah, uh, so much for that one. And now we make the illogical leap from nightgowns to baseball caps. John E. Brown, who listens to us on WFMT in Chicago, was bemused during the first quiz of the season when a pair of non-believers came up with a certain description of the Chicago Cubs. They called his beloved and put upon team hapless. Obviously, Mr. Brown is a Cubs fan. White, House, White Sox fans, he claims, are too unregenerate to know that opera even exists. I hasten to reiterate that the opinions expressed here are those of the passionate listeners, not those of the innocent moderator who happens to be something of an artless Dodger fan. In the spirit of cross-cultural sympathy, our correspondent from the Windy City wants to plead the cause of hapless figures in opera, unfortunate objects of scoffing and laughter. Richard Wojtok, dauntless but hardly hapless maestro extraordinaire, is seated at the Yamaha, prepared to offer clues regarding operatic victims who suffer blood, sweat, and jeers. Gentlemen, who are these people? The first one, Mr. Wojtak. Mr. Wagner's name, hand was up first. Yes, uh, isn't that Balwe Mascara, where Sam and Tom are, are making fun of, um, of our poor hero, uh, uh, of our poor baritone who's just been discovered to be cuckolded? They're making, yes, they're making fun of the tenor, I believe. Is it the tenor at that point? No, it is the baritone. It You're absolutely baritone. right. I, I, I and they're singing the immortal words, ha, 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 ha. ha. <laughs> and Mr. I wish I'd written those words. Mr. Gainsey, did you want to add something to that? Well, no, only that th they're laughing at him because they, they think that he's there in the woods making love with his own wife. That's yes. indeed true. I also think the White Sox are going to do well this year. <laughs> <laughs> Not to mention the artless Dodgers. <laughs> and the next one, please, Mr. Voitok. Puzzled looks, Mr. Gainsley is trying to be brave, and would you care to make a guess? Again? <laughs> <laughs> it's, the end. <laughs> it's the end of an act in an opera, in a French opera. The chorus is very amused by what has just transpired. Oh, of course, it's Le Conte of Man. Yes. It's Le Conte. <laughs> right. Tales of Hoffman, you want to describe the scene? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Yes it's, yes, it's the first act, as a matter of fact. It's Coppelia, the Coppelia Act. It's the first act, and they're laughing at uh, Hoffman because he's in love with an automaton. Uh, automaton. And her name is? Uh, Olympia. Olympia, indeed. Right. The next one, please, Mr. Wojtak. General mystification. That sounded lovely. Any yeah. guesses? Any any hot ideas? Press uh, one other clue would be useful. Ah, <laughs> uh, now they know. <laughs> <laughs> the first hand was that of Mr. Wagner. It was love of love for three oranges. Also coffee. known as the FBI and peace. The FBI and, and peace and war. <laughs> <laughs> yes, tell us about I it. I haven't got the vaguest idea. <laughs> <laughs> Does anyone have a vague idea? The prince in the opera is a unfortunate fellow who cannot laugh, cannot smile, until Trufaldino, the jester, tries to eject from the court a strange woman, the witch Fata Morgana, 
There's a scuffle. She falls. When she falls, her feet are in the air. The prince sees her red underwear and laughs. Yes, Mr. Wagner. Barrel of laughs at Prokofiev. I beg your pardon? Barrel of laughs at Prokofiev. Yes, <laughs> barrel of laughs. The next one, please, Mr. Wojtyla. One. We're still in Russia. Oh, it's Mr. Hubei. Is Boris good enough? Yes, indeed. Simpleton. Yeah. See, with the simpleton and the and the crowd, and the simpleton, they they're they're sort of jeering at the simpleton. Yes, the uh, the children. Children. That's right. Children are mocking yeah. and scoffing the fool, the simpleton, either in the Chromie Forest scene or the Saint Basil scene, depending on which, which version of the opera we're listening to. And finally, Mr. Boyta. Take a stab at Puccini. Mr. Gainsley. Puc is it Puccini? Puccini, a very good, incorrect guess. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Any other guess? It's German, and it's an opera dear to my critical heart. Mr. Hubert. Could that be Meister Singer? It could indeed be Meister and Singer. And it's Beckmesser? Yes, indeed. Oh, good. Beckmesser in the last act. What, what's happened here? Oh, the, uh, he's, singing, he's singing his version of the Prize Song very badly and out of tune completely, and he's being jeered by the, by the populace. Very good. Opera, like everything else in this imperfect world, can be accident-prone. We know that now. Things can go wrong. Listeners who heard Le Nozze di Figaro uh, at the beginning of the season may recall, for instance, that illness plagued Barbara Bonney, the excellent Susanna, and she had to be replaced by Joyce Geyer in the middle of the third act. We've received many letters on this subject, but the first one came from Nate Rind of North Belmore, New York, who listens to us over WQXR. He wonders if the panelists ever attended a performance in which the gods proved unkind. If so, what happened, to whom, and how were the problems solved? Three smiles. Mr. Wagner. Well, it's not really very, very funny. I, I was here at the return of Renata Tebaldi in a performance of La Forza del Destino when Leonard Warren dropped dead after singing Una Fatale on stage. It was a horrific moment. Um, after a pause, the curtain came down. Uh, amid dead silence, and then the announcement was made, the performance was ending. Uh, it did not go on, obviously. Yeah, I think Rudolf Bing himself he appeared before the curtain, asked the said, audience to rise in memory, memory of a great artist. Yes, Philip Gainsley. On tour, on tour, um, the first season that Louisa was in the um, repertory. Louisa Miller. Oh, not, not Charpentier. No, Louisa Miller. Um, I won't name the tenor who was indisposed, but the stage manager came before the curtain to announce that the tenor was indisposed and announced further that his role would be assumed by Richard Tucker, and the house just went in madness. I mean, it was really a step up, and it was a <laughs> marvelous, marvelous performance that people who paid tickets, uh, paid for tickets, uh, got more than their money's worth and more than they expected. And they say there is no God. <laughs> there, there is one and she's kind. <laughs> Mr. Hubeck. Uh, La Forza del Destino, uh, and I believe the last year is the old house. Or the, it's always a force of destiny, it's, isn't it? It is. It's a terrible mm -hmm. opera for problems. Almost but, as bad as uh, Macbeth. Right? The Leonora wasn't well. She starred the performance. It was Martina Arroyo. And she got to the convent scene and at one point went into the convent and when who came out was Lucina Mara. <laughs> it's true. A, a drastic change. And the announcement had to be made, of course. There was no the announcement made uh, uh, during, the, uh, during the first act. And then there was an announcement made at the, uh, at the interval after that. It's a hard thing to do. Uh, it would be even worse if it happened in the last act, because then it would be very difficult to make that announcement. I guess that happened in the have... Figaro. They'd have to come before the bows or after to explain what happened. Larry Hamberlin of Rochester, Vermont, who listens to us over station WVPR in Burlington, is intrigued by the realization that numerous operas list composers as characters, sometimes even as central characters. He wants the panel to name some of these and to tell us if the composer in question is real or fictitious. Mr. Wagner. One of my favorite operas as a composer uh, that's critical of the entire action, the composer in Ariadne of Naxos <coughs> by yes. Richard Strauss, 
um, who uh, in the opening scene falls in love with Zerbanetta and, and finds that music is going to be his or her, to Trauserl, best sucker in the future. Musik ist eine heilige Kunst, he says. Uh, yeah. Does that composer have a name? Not to my knowledge, just a composer. Uh, real or fictitious? He's fictitious. Although it might be argued that Strauss had some of himself in that character. I sincerely hope so. It's a wonderful character. Mr. Hube. The other Strauss opera that composer figures in is, uh, is Capriccio. Flamen, I believe, is the composer's Flamon. name. Yes. Flamon. And this, the whole opera is an argument between the composer and the librettist. I don't know who wins. The audience wins in the long run, I think. It's a philosophical argument, yeah. as you indicate, between the two, indicating which comes first, the relative the music importance or the words. of the words or the music. Well, which comes first, I think. Yeah. yeah. And the answer is? Does Strauss give the answer? Well, I, I, I don't know. I love the last scene so much with her monologue. I think that's the answer. And, of course, <laughs> the final phrases are musical without any words. Exactly. But he never says it. No. Mr. Gainsley. My hand was not up. I, I, <laughs> I can't think of an Can opera. Can you think of any operas in which there are not fictitious, but genuine, real composers as characters? Mr. Wagner. Well, it's clearly Mozart and Salieri. Yes. Uh, that's uh, what comes right to mind. Um, Written uh, by? Uh, it's uh, Rimsky, isn't it? Rimsky Corsica, Mozart and Salieri, probably the inspiration for Amadeus. I certainly hope so. <laughs> in one way or another. Any other ones? Opera in which the composer is the title character much loved but seldom performed German opera performed at Lincoln Center a couple of summers ago. Oh. Ah, Mr. Hubeck. Palestrina. Yes. Of performed here, actually. Yes. At, in this by house. the Lincoln Center Festival. Yes. Covent Garden production. It's and Hans Palestrina Fitzner, is an opera by Hans Fitzner. Hans Fitzner. Fitzner. Sir. Eric D. Schramm, who listens to the Met broadcast over WOSUFM in Columbus, Ohio, has a question concerning the sudden emergence of the wrong language in the right opera. He offers some lines that don't happen to be in the language of the rest of the libretto. The panelists are asked to identify the opera and the character who speaks in a foreign tongue and the reason for the lapse. Who says, son aspect douce et enchanteur répand de nous, no, répand sur nous, sur nous tout sa lueur. Pardon my French. Uh, who says that? The, the words are, her aspect, sweet and enchanting, shed on us all its light. A gentleman speaking French of the heroine in the middle of a Russian opera. Russian. Oh. Ah, Could Mr. Hubert. Could be Dom. Could be Peak Dom. But it's not. But it's not Peak oh. Dom. <laughs> but there is a moment like that in Peak Dom. Right? There is. Uh, yeah, yes, there indeed. Is. Uh, no, this is in Yevgeny Onyegin, Monsieur Triquet at the ball oh. when he sings of Tatiana. You're all baffled by this, no doubt, because in Soviet performances, the authorities wouldn't permit them to sing this in French, and they translated it back into Russian. And you all know it from your performances at the Bolshoi, I'm yeah. sure. <laughs> <laughs> Who says, Ah, che resiste fuoco astral di fuoco, cordigello di fuoco astral. How could a shaft of fire be resisted? A heart of ice withstand a shaft of fire. It's a tenor aria in a German, German. opera. Is, Mr. Wagner. Is that the tenor aria in Rosenkavalier? Di rigori armato is saying, of course. The tenor <laughs> and the levee of the marshalin. In the first act, uh, she has a bunch of people coming around, milliners and, and pet salesmen and, and, uh, and a tenor, among other things, Indeed. some orphans, and who, uh, he sings. Who says America forever? Oh. Ah, <laughs> Mr. Gaines. Oh, thank you. Ah, that's, <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's Pinker. Pinkerton offering a toast to Sharpless. Or vice versa, I forget. Yeah, it is Pinkerton yeah, first, is, yeah. yeah. And then, but what sells that line is when he pours and says, milk punch or whiskey? Yeah. It is so arrogant when he gives the line. And do you know the, the cute problem, the misprint in milk punch or whiskey? They, one offers a drink to the other. Have any of you ever heard of milk punch? Yeah. I'm old enough to remember. Really? That. Because I'm told that it was a typo in the original libretto that it's milk, comma, punch, oh, really? or whiskey. These are three <laughs> possible drinks that are being offered, and nobody wanted anything as disgusting as milk punch. I'm surprised oh, at that because... The tenor always chooses whiskey in any case. Hmm. <laughs> That's interesting. As any intelligent person would. <laughs> Who says, potage, crème aux perles, écrivez à la bordelaise? It sounds like a menu. It's the first word spoken oh. at the beginning of the opera. Mr. Hubei. It's uh, uh, Samuel Bob is Vanessa. Yes, indeed. Is, was George Chernofsky playing the servant in those days. And who says what to whom? Do you remember? Uh, it's, um, uh, he's offering the menu to, uh, it's uh, 
It's a servant. I don't know the, his name. Actually, it's uh, Erica making, ordering dinner, oh, Eric ordering Mr. Oh. Chehanovsky to make this for oh. dinner. And Vanessa, alias Eleanor Stieber, disapproves of everything she says, and they funny. That's the whole opera. <laughs> Virtually. Who says, besame bobo bobasso, animal un besito. Animal. The translation is something like, kiss me, you fool, you great big fool. Animal, a little kiss. I think you might deduce it's a moment of flirtation. <laughs> <laughs> it's a moment of flirtation between a young appearing woman and a rather old man. Oh, Mr. Hubert. It's the Macropolis. It's a line of Macropolis with the wonderful old lover that finally realizes that it is she, still young, that was the his woman lover of for eternal his youth. age. Yeah. And she knew him when she was a different person, Eugenia Montes. Montes, yes. And it's Hauk Sendor, the, the old man. Very good, gentlemen. Nancy Ross, who listens to us over station WQXR in New York, writes to complain about what seems to be a basic inequity. Many operas, especially those of Verdi, have caring, deeply human father figures as central characters. But where, Ms. Ross wants to know, are the caring, sympathetic mothers? She offers a word of caution to the panel, don't start with Clytemnestra. <laughs> <laughs> Name us some caring mothers. Mr. Hubert. Actually, it's a caring mother, but she cares from a, from a, from a picture. It's in Hoffman, in the third act of Hoffman, uh, with Antonia and the, 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 the mother speaking from the picture. Yes, indeed. One, we have time for one more quick answer. Mr. Gainsley. Azucena is a caring mother. Yes. In your provatory. <laughs> and uh, the, end, the end is not happy, but the mother does what she can. Thank you, Philip Gainsley, Alfred Hubey, and Alan Wagner. This is Martin Bernheimer returning you to Peter Allen in the Texaco Broadcast booth. Det var så Martin Bernheimer, der var quizmaster i Metropolitan Operans quiz her i pausen. Philip Gainsley, Alfred Hubey og Alan Wagner var i panelet. Og de gættede altså for eksempel øh, personer, der går rundt i natkjoler i operaer. Der var bud på Lady Macbeth af Verdi. Hun går rundt og vasker blod af hænderne i natkjole i hvert fald. Søvngængersken Abellini har også meget øh, naturligt en natkjole på. Julie i Gunosrum og Julie. Ophelia i Hamlet af Ambra Thomas. Og Othello, Verdis øh, Destemona øh, i Othello, har også en natkjole på, da hun bliver slået ihjel. Og så var der et par mænd i nat tøj i operaerne Askepot af Rossini og i Puccini's Gianni Schicchi. Så var der et spørgsmål om figurer, der gør grin med hinanden øh, i operaer. Det er der nogen, der gør i Verdis Maskeballet i Offenbachs Hoffmanns Eventyr på Kofchefs Kærligheden til de tre appelsiner i Mussorgskis Boris Gudunov og inde i Wagners Mestersangerne. Så handlede det om komponister i operahandlinger, både rigtige og Opdigtet. Og Richard Strauss han har fundet på et par stykker, som måske nok øh, til dels ligner ham selv. Komponisten i operan Ariadne på Naxos, og også komponisten i operan Capriccio. Og så et par rigtige, tre rigtige i øh, en opera af Rimske Korsakov, er der hele to stykker, nemlig Mozart og Salier. Og i Hans Fitzners opera Palestrina er hovedpersonen jo også komponist. Så handler det om operaer, hvor der er nogen, der pludselig synger på et andet sprog, end det operaren egentlig er skrevet på. Det er der nogen, der gør i Tchaikovskis og Sinoniekin. I Rikard Strauss Rosenkavalleren, som er på tysk, der kommer der en italiensk sanger på et tidspunkt og synger en arie. Og i Madame Butterfly bliver der sunget på amerikansk, America Forever. Og i Samuel Barbers Vanessa bliver der også sunget på andet end det originale sprog, ligesom der bliver gjort i Makropolis-sagen af Leos Janacek. Og så nåede de ikke så frygtelig meget mere i Metropolitan Operans quiz i pausen her. Og med øjeblik fortsætter vi med tredje akt af Lucia Di Lammermor af Donizetti. Or via e-mail, operaquiz at texico.com You can make a date for a memorable evening at the Met by attending a performance of Massenet's Werther or Schoenberg's Moses and Aaron, and for remaining tickets to tomorrow afternoon's Pension Fund Gala, with Placido Domingo featured in selected acts from Faust, Stefelio, and Carmen. Call 212-362-6000, or visit the Met's website at metopera.org. Tickets for performances through the end of the season may be purchased at the Met box office or by telephone at 212 362 6000. 
Ja, man skal nok have fat i en Concorde, hvis man skal nå derover inden i morgen for eksempel, men der var der i hvert fald telefon, når man, man kunne ringe på og bestille billetter til Metropolitan Opera. Om et øjeblik, altså tredje akt af Donizetti's Lucia di Lammermoor, Enrico opsøger Edgardo, som nu bor i sin gamle, forfaldne familieborg. Enrico nyder at kunne fortælle Edgardo, at Lucia netop er blevet gift med Lord Bucklaw. Edgardo udfordrer Enrico til duel. Den skal foregå næste morgen ved hans fars grav. Det er handlingen i første billede her i tredje akt, som altså begynder om et øjeblik i vores Metropolitan Opera-transmission her i aften. Det er Ruth Ann Swenson, der synger Tilpartiet som Lucia. Ramon Vargas synger Edgardo. Enrico bliver sunget af Anthony Michael Moore. Og i de øvrige mindre partier, Raimondo Alastair Miles. Alisa bliver sunget af Jane Shawless. Arturo af Gregory Ture og Normando af Ronald Naldi. Metropolitan Operans kor og orkester spiller og synger under ledelse af dirigenten Carlo Rizzi. Bowing to the house, smiling to the house and turning to conduct. 